And now to return to Cornwall. What were you and Sherlock Holmes doing down there, Dr. Watson? Recuperating. Holmes had spent a particularly active autumn solving three dangerous and exhausting cases in rapid succession. And a vacation was indicated. I had visions of basking in the south of France or sunny Italy. But not Holmes. He elected to return to the small cottage near Paul du Bain, which we had occupied once before. Uh, during the adventure of the Devil's Foot, if I'm not mistaken, Doctor. Right. Now, the bays and inlets of the Cornish Peninsula are green and sheltering in the sunny, sunny summer weather. But in December, the blustering gales whip the surge-swept reefs and black and sinister cliffs. Well, one particularly violent morning, Holmes and I were ensconced on either side of the fireplace. Holmes was engrossed in a consignment of books on philology, which had just arrived from London. Watson, has it ever occurred to you that the ancient Cornish language is akin to the Chaldean? Well, inasmuch as I understand neither Cornish nor Chaldean, I can't say it has. It's quite logical, you know. These shores were undoubtedly visited by early Phoenician traders in tin. In fact, many historians believe that the pirates who later operated from this coast had more than their share of the old Phoenician heritage. A fine, disreputable background for any district. Profitable is the word, Watson. Hello, who's this fighting his way up the path in the teeth of the gale? Hmm. Looks like your rotund friend and fellow archaeologist, Mr. Roundhay, the vicar. I wonder what's occurred to bring the good Domini out in this weather. I'd sooner expect to see a cat go swimming in a mill race. Well, don't let him stand there in the wet. Well, I'm going, I'm going. But you couldn't answer the door now and then. Why, Mr. Roundhay, delighted to see you, old man. Come in, come in. Well, you, you look half drowned. Not half entirely. Totally and entirely soaked to the skin. Morning, Roundhay. How about a spot of hot grog? The tea kettle's boiling on the hearth. Watson, fix the vicar uh, a drink. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I'm afraid I need it as much for my nerves as I do for the chill, you know. Oh? Yes, Mr. Holmes. I have a problem, a, a rather serious problem, and... I really don't know whether to come to Dr. Watson for help or to you. Well, why not consult both of us? Uh, it's not the first time we've collaborated on a case, eh, Holmes? Quiet, Watson. Don't interrupt. Uh, just what is your problem, Mr. Roundhead? Well, it seems that the cradle at Trevining Water has been rocking again. Is that so unusual? You don't understand, Mr. Holmes. That cradle has been in the family for over five centuries. All the young Trevinings are placed in it at birth. It hasn't been used, however, since Wilfrida Trevining, the present Mrs. Gregory, was a child. In fact, the nursery has been kept locked ever since old Matty, the Trevining nurse, was sent off to the home for indigent females at Red Roof three months ago. Uh, she'd been in the family for nearly 60 years, you see. Well, seems rather heartless to get rid of her, eh, Holmes? My thought exactly. But Mortimer Gregory, he's the one who is married to Wilfrida Trevining, was quite determined about the matter. He said that old Matty was making his wife quite ill with her talk about the rocking cradle. What sort of talk? Well, you see, there's a sort of legend in the Trevining family that when one of them is about to die, the cradle starts to rock all by itself. Mm, nice, eerie little superstition, eh, Holmes? As a matter of fact, the cradle had been heard rocking once or twice, but, but inasmuch as old Matty was still sleeping in the nursery, the family took it as a rather a grim, practical joke, all except Wilfrida. She became quite ill and upset. At which point her husband, who, who has a violent temper, said the old nurse had to go. Dr. Dennis Trevining, who is Wilfrida's cousin and physician as well, was inclined to agree with him. So they sent for a nurse for Mr. Ives Hospital to take over. On the day that she arrived, I was summoned to drive Matty to the old lady's home in Redruth. I can't say I look forward to the event. Were your fears justified? Completely justified, Mr. Holmes. When I arrived at Trevining Water, the old woman was sitting on her boxes just inside the front door. Mr. Gregory and Dr. Trevining were endeavouring to quiet her catawall. Calls herself a nurse, does she? What does she know about bringing babies into the world? I've given three generations of Trevinings the whack that drove the breath of life into their bodies. <laughs> After all, Matty, I am a doctor. When Wilfrida's baby arrives, I expect to be on hand too, you know. You a doctor? <laughs> I wouldn't trust you to treat my Timothy here. <laughs> hey, Timmy. Timmy agrees with me. He may be a cat, but he knows as much about what's going on around here as I do. That'll and that's do. plenty. Matty, that'll do. 
You've made enough trouble already. You've upset my wife so that she's had to take to her bed. Me upset, Miss Wilfrida. My Miss Willie that I taught to walk and play patty cake and eat a porridge like a good girl. It's not me that's made her sick. And what's more, if any harm comes to her, I'll put a curse on this house. Ten miles of moorland between here and Red Roof. I'll come back and rock the cradle somehow. And you know what that means. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I felt sorry for Matty, of course, but I, I must say I saw Mr. Gregory and Dr. Divining's point. A screaming old crone like that isn't the most soothing influence around a house in which there is an expectant mother. Quite. Uh, tell me, Vicar, is this Mrs. Gregory, the former Wellfrieda Trevining, easily upset by these, these family superstitions about rocking cradles and the like? I really couldn't say, Mr. Holmes. Wilfrida was always a delicate girl. Uh, she was an only child, you see, and the one heir to that branch of the family. Significant, eh, Holmes? I suppose she inherited quite a tidy estate. She did indeed, Dr. Watson. Her father would have disinherited her if he could when she ran off with that Gregory chap. But the estate is entailed, and uh, I must say the marriage turned out better than most of us expected. Then you don't think Mortimer Gregory married her for her money? Uh, not necessarily, Mr. Holmes. Gregory was an artist who came to these parts one summer to do a bit of sketching. And naturally, the Trevinings thought he was one of those uh, near-do-will bohemians. But it seems he's rather famous and sells his pictures for quite handsome prices. I see. I take it the girl and her father reconciled. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When he heard that she was to have a child, he sent for her. Although the child will bear the name Gregory, he will inherit the Trevining estate. The Trevinings are always born at Trevining Water, needless to say. Any other arrangement would be unthinkable. Oh, quite. Uh, Wilfrida Gregory and her new husband came back as soon as possible after receiving her father's letter asking for reconciliation. One week after the return, old Mr. Trevining was dead, and Wilfrida had inherited the estates. I take it her father's death was sudden and unexpected. Oh, oh quite unexpected, Mr. Holmes. He'd been as fit as a fiddle up to Wednesday night. Thursday, shortly after his mid-afternoon whiskey and soda, he, he complained that his uh, mouth and throat felt sore. Half an hour later, vomiting set in, followed by violent cramps and uh, general collapse. Did no one send for a doctor? Mr. Trevining's nephew, Dr. Dennis Trevining, was in the house at the time. There was, of course, an autopsy and an inquest. Good heavens, no, Mr. Holmes, whatever for? Mr. Trevining had been subject for some years to violent gastro-digestive upsets. It was all perfectly unavoidable and natural. An autopsy is always indicated in any case of sudden death, Mr. Rante. But, but, but what good would it do? It might just possibly prevent another fatality. Just when did Mrs. Gregory's health begin to fail? Her father's death was a shock to her. She took to her bed for about a week after the funeral. It was quite understandable, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. After that, she was up and about for a month or two, but uh, her color was bad, and she seemed to be decidedly nervous. Uh, like a good many women in the early stages of her condition, she experienced a certain amount of uh, nausea. Has that nausea persisted? It has, Mr. Holmes, and when old Matty began to rant on about the rocking cradle, Mrs. Gregory became thoroughly alarmed and well, had to be put to bed. Did her condition improve, Mr. Rondhay, after they got rid of the old woman? For a time, she seemed greatly improved. She was up and about for nearly a month, and week before last, she suffered a rather frightening relapse and has been in bed ever since. I see. How soon is her baby due to be born? Oh, in about a fortnight, I believe. Has Dr. Trevining called in any outside medical opinion? No, Mr. Holmes, but that's not too incredible when you realize how removed we are from civilization. Possibly if they knew that Dr. Watson was here in the vicinity. The, the, the new nurse made that suggestion to Dr. Trevining, but both he and Mr. Gregory were decidedly hostile to the idea. The nurse is, I may say, rather badly frightened. Today was her day off, and she dropped in at the vicarage shortly after breakfast. She admitted she had never been so terrified in her entire life living there in the old Trevining house, part keep, part castle, but she said she wasn't the only one. Oh? No? Poor Mrs. Gregory lies there, stiff with terror, with her eyes fixed on the ceiling, waiting for it to begin. The sound of the cradle rocking. Getting dark. Light the lamp. Very well, Mrs. Gregory. Uh, that's better. When I was a child, I was afraid of the dark, and now it's all come back to me. I dread the coming of night. When one's sick, that's only natural. The nights are so long, I always think. Well, it's not badness. When night comes, it, it begins. The rocking of the cradle. I lie here, watching for it. Yes. 
listen. I don't hear anything, Mrs. Gregory. Oh, if only I could be sure my baby is born before I die. It's so terribly important, Miss. But you're not going to die, Mrs. Gregory. Yes, I am. That's why the cradle's rocking. And listen, there it goes. Rock, rock, rock. It's for me, Miss. It's for me. <laughs> Sounds like delirium, eh, Holmes? A cradle that is heard only by a desperately sick woman? But you don't understand, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Gregory isn't the only one who hears the cradle rocket. The nurse can hear it, too. The nursery at Trevining Water is directly over the master bedroom, and that rocking cradle can be heard several times a night. But only intermittently. That's right, Mr. Holmes. And never in the daytime? No, always after dark. Uh, Miss Henderson, the nurse, says it's having a, a dreadful effect on Mrs. Gregory. She's in a state of great exhaustion. In the last few days, the nurse has also noticed a, a local pustular eruption. Um, that could be induced by the nervous strain, I suppose. Not necessarily. Yes, I think Dr. Watson and I had better pay a visit to Trevining Water shortly after dark today. I trust we can persuade her family to allow Dr. Watson to have a look at Mrs. Gregory. And I think I can suggest what he's to look for. As for myself, I'm more interested in what causes that cradle to rock. <laughs> Did you have to drag us out in this beastly weather, Holmes? Besides, it's all so dashed irregular, contrary to medical ethics and all that, you know. After all, I haven't been called in by either the doctor on the case, nor the family. Uh, you doctors and your confounded medical ethics. I suppose you've let the poor woman die just because you haven't been properly introduced. This is where we turn in, Mr. Holmes. Notice the trevining coat of arms over the gate. Aha. Very significant, Mr. Roundhead. Oh, what's so significant about it? I could hardly see the blasted thing in this fading light. For one thing, the Trevinings have the bar sinister. For another, that was the Jolly Roger up in the upper right-hand quarter. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The Trevinings have more than their share of pirate ancestors. They, they boast of the fact, you know. Well, here we are. This is Trevining Water. Frightening-looking old pile, eh, Holmes? You bet. Wait for us here, Jonathan. Right. We may be leaving in rather a hurry. Give the bell a pull, Watson. Uh, no, wait. I, I sent word to Miss Henderson to be on the lookout for us. Ah, Miss Henderson, I, I thought you'd be watching for us. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Come in, please. I'm so glad you've both come. Both. Mrs. Gregory was having a particularly bad spell when I returned this afternoon. Have you told Mrs. Gregory's husband and her doctor that you expected us? No, Mr. Holmes. Fortunately, there was no opportunity. The doctor was called out on a confinement case an hour or so ago, and Mr. Gregory has had to go to St. Ives for the assizes. He shouldn't be back until after supper. Excellent. You will take Dr. Watson to see Mrs. Gregory immediately. Mr. Roundhay knows the house well enough to direct me to the nursery, I gather. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Top floor, second right. I'm afraid the door is kept locked, Mr. Holmes. My dear young lady, it takes more than a locked door to stop Sherlock Holmes. Come along, Vicar. Here we are. It's the next door. It's locked right enough. Then there's nothing we can do. On the contrary, I have a very neat little jemmy that I acquired when I was instrumental in apprehending a certain famous cat burglar. Mm. Quite a breeze coming through the keyhole. You mean you're going to pick the lock? It may take a moment or so. Well, I, I do hope no one comes and catches us at it. I, I, I don't know what my flock would say. Mr. Holmes, did you hear that? There it is again. It's, it's inside the nursery. Yes. Yes, it's the cradle, right enough. But it's rocking. It's, it's rocking in there all by itself. It, it, it's not just a superstition. Confound it. This lock must be rusty. No, here it comes. Last it. Did it have to make that noise? Easy now. I'm going to open the door. It's so dark in there. Give me the candle. I'm going in. But the room is empty. Completely empty. But look here, the cradle's still rocking. And feel the mattress. It's still warm. But the good Lord, what was that? Branch of a tree scraping against the window. Yes, it's broken one of the small five-inch square panes of glass, and that explains where the draft came from. It also explains something else. Yes, interesting. 
Very interesting. Who let you in this room? Ah, Mr. Gregory, no doubt. I am Sherlock Holmes. What in blazes do you think you're doing here? Trying to solve the mystery of the rocking cradle. Rotten rubbish. Old wives' tales. I'll not have my wife upset by any more of that nonsense. You misjudge us, Mr. Gregory. We only want to save your wife and possibly your child. I don't need your help. Get out, both of you. Get out! With pleasure. I imagine Watson's had time to give the nurse full instructions, and we've seen all there is to see up here. Come on, Ron Hay. We'll now ride over to Red Roof. The final piece to this puzzle is doubtless to be found in the old lady's home. Uh, you you mean you're, you're going to question Matty? I trust you have no objections, Mr. Gregory. Uh, objections? No, go ahead. You'll get nothing from her. Nothing at all. <laughs> So kind of you to see us, Matron, particularly this late in the evening. It is well after our visiting hours, Mr. Rounded. But when they told me it was the vicar of Tredanic Wallace, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'll admit my curiosity got the best of me. Oh, but you gentlemen must be congealed. May I offer you a cup of tea? Uh, thank you, Matron, but we've no time for social amenities. Our night's work has only just begun. So, if you'll allow us to have a few words with one of your inmates, uh, Miss Matty, what's her other name, Vicar? Bless my soul, I don't know. But she was nurse in the Trevining household for many years. She, she came here to the home three months ago. Oh, you mean Mattie Fennelly, Ah, Of course, of course. I'm afraid you can't see Mattie, gentlemen. Why not? Is anything wrong with her? Is she ill? No, Mr. Holmes. Mattie Fennelly died six weeks ago. Died? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But why wasn't I told? Why wasn't her body brought back to us for proper burial? Oh, I understand her family didn't want Mrs. Gregory to know. They were afraid the shock of Mattie's death would upset her. Quite. Matron, how did the old woman die? Had she been sick long? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. She'd had a very good day. Mrs. Gregory had driven over from Tredanic to have tea with her. She brought a pancake for Mattie. Palm cake was her favorite, it seems. How soon after Mrs. Gregory left was Mattie taken ill? Not till the middle of the night. Seems she sneaked the rest of the pound cake off to bed with her and had eaten it after the lights were put out. Well, people and children frequently make pigs of themselves, I'm afraid. We sent for Dr. Dennis Trevining at once. He lives halfway between Redruth and Tredanic Wallace. He was here inside of an hour. She seemed to get better when she saw him. Shortly thereafter, she had another attack, which ended in a complete collapse. Oh, this is an exasperating case, eh, Holmes? One blind alley after another, old Matty turning up dead... Slams the final door in our face. On the contrary, we may very well find out more from Matty dead than we would if she were alive. But where will you go to question her, Mr. Holmes? To the graveyard, of course. Where is she buried, Matron? In the churchyard at St. Stephen's. It's on the cliffs at the other side of the town. I don't suppose you could supply us with a couple of shovels, Matron. Oh, Holmes, you're not thinking of exhuming the body at this hour of the night. Why not? Just one more question, Matron. What happened to Matty's cat after her death? Timothy? Yes. Oh, he disappeared shortly after the funeral. No one knows what happened to him, Mr. Holmes. I think I can make a guess, Matron. Yes, I think I can make a guess. Ask the millions of men who wear Clippercraft clothes. Ask the fine stores that make them available to you everywhere, from coast to coast. The reason there's so much talk about Clippercraft is that they're so extremely fine at the price of just ordinary clothes. It's a pleasure to discuss Clippercraft on this program because I know I do a good turn to every man listening in. Regardless of price, you've never seen finer tailoring, longer wearing woolens, or more perfect fit. Suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. The famous Clipper Craft plan makes all this possible. It concentrates the buying power of 924 leading independent stores across the nation. You get the savings that result from this group buying. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Oh, here, you two.
take the shovel, Holmes. It's your turn. I'm exhausted. That's what comes of letting yourself get out of condition. Yes, I like that. Oh, thank heaven the gale has gone down. But the sea is still boiling. The moon's trying to break through the clouds. It makes the breakers down there look like a devil's cauldron. Job's done. Now, Watson, if you and Mr. Roundhay will help me lift out the coffin. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Oh, the authorities will probably raise Ned. And now, all together. One, two... I see, Holmes. The coffin was remarkably light. Oh, Natty was a very little woman. Holmes, look. There's someone galloping over the moor as if the devil were after him. He's coming here. Good Lord, it's, it's Dr. Trevining. Oh, we have in for it now. Oh, there, Vixen. It is, it is. Now then, just what's going on here? Uh, 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 Dr. Trevining, we're, we're just taking a, uh, a look at old Matty and Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, oh he did. Busy body, meddler. I heard you came to Divining this afternoon and saw my patient without consulting me. And now this. I suppose you've got a permit for this. No, I can't say we have. We couldn't afford to take time. Why not? We didn't want to give you the opportunity to finish off Mrs. Gregory the way you did her father and old Matty. I... Finish off my uncle and Matty? Why, why should I do that? Because you were determined to inherit the estate of Trevining Water. If you had to kill off half the parish to do it. You're mad. There's no proof. The bodies are both decomposed. I wonder... Would you like to help us pry off the lid of this coffin? Watson, hand me that chisel. I protest. This is monstrous. Not as monstrous as murder, Dr. Trevining. Now then. Slide the lid off the other side, Watson. All right. Now, Mr. Roundhay, if you'll bring the lantern over here. Uh, yes. Thank you. Good Lord. The body. She looks exactly the way she did when she died. When she died in agony, remember? No, no. Put back the lid. It, it's too unnatural. Her, her eyes, she's staring at me in that awful grin. There was no autopsy on old Mr. Trevining. In this case, however... But I... Would you like to put your hand on the body, Dr. Trevining? No, no. There's a local superstition that when a murderer touches the body of his victim, blood will flow. No, no. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. He's right. He's riding in the wrong direction. He's headed for the cliffs. Good Lord. He rode the horse straight over the edge. They'll be smashed to death on the reefs. The Devil's Cauldron, as Watson called it, has claimed its own. Yes, the rocks on which his pirate ancestors wrecked so many helpless ships. I'm not surprised the sight of old Matty's body unnerved him. Who would suspect that after six weeks there would be almost no signs of decomposition? I not only suspected it, Mr. Roundhay, I knew. How so? Dr. Dennis Trevining chose one of the few poisons that also tends to act as a preservative. I allude, of course, to tartar emetic, commonly called antimony. By that story was a corker, Dr. Watson, and Dennis Trevining was certainly a throwback to his pirate ancestors. Yes, Mr. Harris. But look, why didn't he finish off his uncle and his cousin years before? Because as long as Wilfreda had no child, he was due to inherit anyway. You mean the estate wouldn't have gone to her husband? No, Mr. Harris. In England, the laws of inheritance are rather rigid. If a married woman who owns estates dies after giving birth to a living child, her husband will hold the lands for life as tenant by the courtesy of England. And that's what Dennis Trevining was determined to prevent at any cost. But why didn't Wilfrida die as quickly as her father, Doctor? Because more than one sudden death in the family would have been suspicious. Therefore, Wilfrida was given repeated small doses of the poison, which produced rather different symptoms. And what about Maddie? Matty undoubtedly suspected what was going on, but was afraid to say anything. Hence the cradle rocking. She was trying to warn her mistress. Eventually, when she was taken ill from overeating, the temptation to get her out of the way was too great, and Dr. Tevining killed her too. But the cradle, Doctor, it continued to rock after her death. Who rocked the cradle? The cat. Matty's black cat, Timothy. He found his way back to his old home, climbed up the tree outside the nursery window and entered through the broken window pane and made himself at home in the most comfortable piece of furniture, the old cradle. 
Holmes knew at once what had happened. Well, how, Doctor? By observing some short black cat hair on the mattress. Of course, it's also obvious. <laughs> yes. One Sherlock Holmes points out the explanation. <laughs> Got me that time. Well, Dr. Watson, what's our story to be about next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you how Professor Moriarty ran amuck during Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, stealing famous jewels, robbing banks, blackmailing millionaires, and uh, finally how he came very close to blowing up a ball at Buckingham Palace. Oh, <laughs> my